can you share with us sort of the realities of what happens when you're under eating? If you had done calorie restriction, basically what you're doing is sending signals to your body that says, we don't have enough, we're really hungry, can't find enough food, your body will start to shut down anything that is non-essential. If you had like really nice thick hair or you know your nails were really strong and thick, sexual function goes down, testosterone or your sex hormones might change. And then when you find the food, now it's very easy to be on the other side of that balance and now you can gain weight rather quickly. When I'm short on time or out traveling, carnivore snacks are a tremendous time saver. They give me a delicious, zero cooking required meal without any weirdo ingredients. No matter what cut you choose, they're always just meat and salt. That's it. I know exactly what I'm getting and I love them all. Use code the Carnitarian for 15% off your order at carnivoresnacks.com. Hey everybody, today I am so excited. I have one of my all-time favorites on the show. I would love to welcome to the channel, Casey Ruff, who is a certified personal trainer. He has been since 2007. He's a lifestyle coach, also a co-carnivore coach. He's a performance enhancement uh, specialist and co-creator of Boundless Body, which he owns with his wife, Bethany. Uh, they are in Utah, and he is also host of Boundless Body Radio. He is just a super kind, super fit, super fun, and chill guy. I love every time I get to talk to you, Casey. Welcome to the channel. Uh, thank you, Linda, so very much for the kind words. Um, you and I were chatting offline about how much we love talking to each other and interacting. We've always had really great um, interviews together, and it's been an honor to host you on, on our show as well. Um, a few weeks ago, I was at the Hack Your Health conference with James Lehman, and I kind of realized, like, you and I get to talk to some, like, super cool people in the community, people we look up to. There, there, There's, like, those people. There's also people you host, and you may not ever talk to them again. But then there's, like, your friends. You know what I mean? Like, you, you meet some Somebody and you you want to hang out with them. It's not just that you do the interview, like you really like them and want to get to know them and spending so much time with James over that weekend like was so much fun. I think of us in the same way, like hopefully we get to meet one day and um, hang out because I feel like we'd be just like great friends, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. I feel like since minute one that I say this all the time, like since I spoke with you, that there's the first 10 seconds of speaking with you. I'm like, I like this guy. He's cool. <laughs> you're my people. <laughs> uh, you're my people as well. <laughs> I love it every I love it every time. And I loved the one episode. I mean, I love all the episodes that we do, but there was that one episode which we always referenced, the Q and A um that was on your podcast that I loved that because I think it's really great when two people with experience talking to others who are on this carnivore journey can share what they've seen in the experience of coaching people through this. And there's so much to be learned because you're not just talking to somebody who's got their own experience dealing with the carnivore diet, say, or meat-based diet, but you've got somebody who has seen dozens of other people go through it and has coached them through the ups, the downs, and you know you can sort of get so much more knowledge from somebody like that. And so I think it's great when you and I get together and we can talk about all the things we've seen. And since we've spoken, I've been seeing a lot of stuff. Since that Q&A, there's a lot of um, interesting things that have changed in the carnivore space. Um, and we, we will absolutely have to get into some of these things. So uh, first of all, for our listeners who don't yet know you, who don't have the pleasure yet of knowing you, can you talk a little bit about what got you started and interested in, in a meat-based diet, carnivore diet? I, don't, I can't believe I don't know this, but please do tell us like, how did you get started in this? What, what led you to carnivore or meat-based? And what are you doing? Like, what are your meals like lately? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So to kind of cut to that chase, you know, I've been, like you said, a personal trainer for 17 years now. So I started in 2007. I worked for a big um, corporation that has gyms all over the country. Um, I was interested primarily in like heart rate training and help doing like VO2 testing and testing people's metabolisms. Um, so we could test how many calories somebody would burn in a day, how many 
calories somebody would burn per minute during certain forms of exercise at certain intensities. Um, we would also be able to tell people where they would burn their calories from. So whether they were burning predominantly fat versus burning our other fuel source, which is carbohydrates. So we learned over time that if you took an endurance athlete like myself, like I was, you know, a cyclist competing at the time, if you took a cyclist and rather than feed them what we all know we eat, which is just tons of carbohydrates and sports products and goos and gels and all that stuff. Uh, if you stop feeding them the carbohydrates, you started feeding them the fat, it would actually really improve their endurance because carbohydrates, you just don't store very many of them to be used uh, for exercise, for energy. You, you, classically, we wouldn't need that many. So you could shift the metabolism from somebody to be a, a predominantly a fat burner by changing the diet, introducing more fat and limiting carbohydrates to improve um, endurance. And so that was quite Quite interesting to me that was several years into my career that I started to learn that and along with that came you know you started to see that that people would implement that kind of information for one thing but then they would also like lose a bunch of weight lose a bunch of fat um feel really good it was just a surprising way that they got there you know what I mean and like I'll always talk about this. Like somebody sent me an article. It was actually an interview that Nina Teichels had did. This is back in 2014 when her book, The Big Fat Surprise, had just come out. And I was already aware that fat could help improve somebody's endurance and, and you could eat more of it and be okay. I, so I was aware of Nina's work back in 2014, but I didn't even read her book until 2016 because I think I had quite a bit of resistance to the idea that like, if what she's saying is true and what I'm is observing doing these tests are true, then everything I've been taught about nutrition, I'm supposed to tell my clients is wrong. Like that was, I think a bit of like cognitive dissonance to me. Um, so it took me a while to kind of really come around to the idea that saturated fat could be good for you. Animal products are good for you as part of a healthy diet. Um, I was lucky I was never like a vegetarian or anything, but it was just a slow progression, like including more fat in the diet, you know, not needing as many carbohydrates. Um, once I got certified as a personal trainer, I kind of got re-indoctrinated into the idea that you need vegetables, you need whole grains started teaching that way again and people just wouldn't get as good of results um and and not only were we doing that kind of like metabolic testing at my gym that i was working at but we were also doing weight loss contests um which were terrible we hated them as personal trainers we have sales quotas and we've got to sign up a certain number of people to do these contests with us they started out being a, a three-month challenge and the company made tons of money by discounting their products we would do that twice a year so then they moved that to be four times a year doing a 60-day challenge which is which is four times a year and we hated it. You give people a big packet of exercise and the meal plans and the ingredient list. So like people go to the store looking for arrowroot powder and rutabagas, like all these like obscure fruits and vegetables and not know what to do with it. So people would fail. The compliance percentage was very, very low of people that would end the contest, that would start the contest. But um <clears throat> Again, we, we hated doing them, but we would have to do them to work for the company. Eventually, I found a guy who, um, you know, I did his initial assessment and, and found out that he was just the kind of guy that was eating tons of carbohydrates, waking up in the middle of the night, eating cereal at two in the morning. I said, like, hey, like, you should maybe get some more fat in your diet to help keep you more satiated. He came back to me in the next few days and was like, hey, I lost like two or three pounds in a few days. What's this keto stuff? And I was like, you know, I've seen it on the cover of a magazine at the grocery store, but I didn't know that much about it. And that was in 2018. And that was really started my um, obsessed passion into trying to learn as much as I can about not only, you know, nutrition, but also proper nutrition, ketogenic diets, which, you know, I then kind of transition onto. You get into that world and you start to hear about these outliers. Like, of course, I'd heard Dr. Baker on Joe Rogan. That's the first time I'd ever heard about carnivore. Um, I turned that episode off um, halfway through because I thought it was ridiculous. It was only like last year I went back and like actually listened to the whole interview. But then you come across, you know, Paul Saladino at the time and Sally Norton, uh, Ambrose Hearn, like all these other people that are doing this weird diet and they seem to be really thriving. So it was April 1st of uh, 2019. Ironically, it was April Fool's Day, but it was no joke. I started my carnivore diet. And uh, yeah, I've been what I would consider to be carnivore uh, ever since. Um, I appreciate now that there's there's people that are trying to make exact definitions of what a quote unquote carnivore diet is. That's never bothered me because I've always thought of the definition of carnivore as a carnivore in nature eats about 70 to 80 percent of their calories from animal products. And so whether somebody is carnivore, strict carnivore, meat-based, animal-based, whatever term you want to use, I just think of it all as the same thing and don't get too worked up about it. 
I started that in April of 2019 and really have done that pretty consistently since. Um, a day in the life, you asked me my diet. I keep things very simple, so I will include coffee in the morning. I still do um, a bit of butter and MT MCT oil. I'll also do salt in my coffee, which I quite enjoy. Um, I find the mental benefit uh, to be the 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 best or the reason why I keep the coffee in with the MCT oil in particular. Mm -hmm. um, I start at six in the morning with my clients. And so I, I can't like stumble into the office. I'm, you know, performing at six in the morning. So that helps with that. Um, but other than that, uh, some days I do a snack of eggs, hard boiled eggs, uh, you know, around noon or one or two, just depending on the day and how busy I am today. I didn't get to that. So I'm, you know, kind of fasting through the day and then I'll have a big meal at night when most of my work is done. I close my laptop and then it's whatever sounds good to me. I try to have a few options on hand um, I, I found a you know the um you know the grill that dr baker uses in all his videos that's like the auto grill that is like shoots flames out of it yes, and like I've seen it. steak yeah really really <laughs> Yeah, really quick. Um, I wanted to do something like that, but they're so expensive. Like an auto grill, I want to say, is like $1,000. There's another brand. I think they started like $2,000. I found one on Amazon that's like $150. bucks. i have had now for pretty much the whole year. It makes a perfect steak in like 90 seconds on each side. So I've been doing a lot more like either ribeyes or New York's or whatever kind of cut sounds good. Also, this is kind of weird, but I definitely noticed this in some of my clients. During the summertime when it gets a little warmer like it is now, chicken never sounds good to me. But for whatever reason, like grilled marinated chicken to me sounds like really, really good. So I'll just marinate some chicken during the day and grill up a whole batch. And I just at night when I get to dinner time, hopefully, again, I've got a few different options. And I just kind of see like what sounds good, what looks good. And I just choose that and eat until I'm really satiated. And I sit in my sauna and I go to bed. So <laughs> amazing. I mean, it sounds like quite a plan. I love it. And I agree with you. It's funny. Like is, ch is chicken the fruit of carnivore? Is chicken like Probably. the light? It's the light and refreshing thing of carnivore. <laughs> Good for some. Probably. Summer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, it, it is weird. Like most people I talk to say the same thing. Like it, it's not that good over time on carnivore. I think red meat becomes really the staple for people. It's amazing to see women, you know, at first they don't eat any red meat and they're mostly chicken or fish and they have a nibble of red meat and they have a little bit more and then you give them enough time and they turn into red meat savages and that's all they want. It's quite interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, but yeah, I, I keep things, I keep things really easy. I, again, like marinades, yeah, I try to choose one with the least amount of crap in it, but it's a marinade. I'm not going to get too worked up about what's actually in it. Um, condiments. Sometimes I use low sugar condiments. I use spices. You know, things come in and go out here or there. I know where I feel best and that's where I tend to stay because it's, like you said, it's simple. It's really easy for me. I feel good. Um, and I would say the primary reason that I'm still doing carnivore there's lots of different things that I noticed as far as benefits, but the biggest one that really surprised me was um, I was already like a pretty positive and optimistic and upbeat kind of person, but that kind of 10 day to two week mark starting carnivore where like, I was just like happy and there wasn't a lot of stress. And like, it was just, you know, I looked at a tree or at a bird and it was just like kind of joyous. And like, there was no reason for it to be, you know, it was like a Tuesday. Like, it's not that big of a deal. And like, it was amazing. And that, that, that realization of like, oh yeah, the anxiety I'd been carrying around for so long without knowing it kind of just, just dropped out. And it's helped me to just be a lot more chill and deal with stress a lot better. And that is for sure the primary reason why I stay, you know, carnivore. When I drift off and have something different, it might taste good for a while, but like my sleep will suck. I, I my stomach will hurt. And the big thing is like, my, I do feel anxiety. I feel anxious and I just, it's not worth it for me. So. That whole point of it not being worth it to switch something else is something that I've experienced too. And like you said, you don't realize how good you can feel until you make that switch. And you didn't realize that you're living with this like low level anxiety, but then now things are sort of just better. And why would you want to, you know, mess with that going back to something that's not going to make you feel happy all the time? I mean, you're so chill, like what to maintain chill is health promoting in itself, I think. So there's just no, no reason. Yeah, I, I wanted agree. to ask you, oh, I wanted okay. to ask you a question that you touched on challenges for a bit. So let's get into just the challenges that you were having people do as a trainer working at that gym. I'm sure were very different. Like you said, you were indoctrinated into a more of like a, a healthy, um, probably a low fat kind of um, food pyramid sort of thing that trainers did. Oh, I'm sure there was whole grains involved and stuff like that. The challenges that I see frequently now in the carnivore space 
I would love if you could address your feelings on these challenges, such as how do you feel about a sardine challenge? How do you feel about something like a beef, butter, and eggs challenge, um, an 80-20 challenge where you try to hit a specific macro? In general, do you feel like it's the, the trouble with challenges is the challenge or is it the, what that challenge is, uh, what that challenge consists of? How do you feel about challenges? This is a great question. I love this. Um, let me start with the first piece when I was with this gym. So again, they introduced these challenges as a way to um, motivate people, get trainers in front of people, like a personal trainer that works for a gym like that. They work, we work 100% commission. So it is a very high sales environment, which is not my favorite. Um, it, you know, we want to help people and want to get in front of people and offer services that benefit them. But like we had sales goals that we would have to target. I got demoted from a position where I took a regional role and was managing a bunch of stuff regionally. And since my sales goals fell while doing that, I actually got demoted from that position because that's the way the company goes. So it's just how it is. So don't love that part, but that's again, the way it went. They started this challenge as a way to motivate people. They made tons of money. And so they just kept doing it over and over and over again. And so the, the pattern again would be like, okay, somebody signs up, they're, again, very motivated. We give them a bunch of meal plans. The meal plans are, like you said, it's it's what we would call like a balanced diet. Uh, we would explain to people like what a portion of fat looks like, a portion of vegetables, a portion of protein, a portion of carbohydrates based on your fist and your hand size. So people could, okay, I want, you know, one cup of vegetables. I want one fist size of carbohydrates. I want one palm of protein and one thumb of fat. And then again, we give people like literal ingredient lists that were just obscure stuff that nobody knows anything like what to do with it. There would be recipes, but they would be, you know, difficult. They're not that easy. If, if you don't have a lot of skill or know-how in the kitchen, there would be no way you could really execute a lot of this stuff. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's like it would require you at the very least to go to the store on a Sunday maybe and go shop for all these ingredients, multiple stores, come home prep everything that takes hours, portion everything out into the things you're going to eat, and you start and you do it. And it's a Monday and you get it done. And it's a Tuesday and you get it done. And it's Wednesday and you really don't want that soggy bag of baby carrots and, you know, the portion of salad that's going bad, but you do it anyway. And then it's like Thursday and Friday and you're sick of the food. You're really hungry. Your cravings are going through the roof. And then you have a little cheat and then you have a lot of a cheat. And then it's like, okay, diet starts Monday all over again. And it's the same with, you know, the exercise. A lot of the exercise that we're told to give people is calories in, calories out. And so not only do I want you to eat less as far as calories, but I want you to burn so many calories, you know, during exercise. And so we would have clinics and, you know, kettlebell classes and cycling classes and running classes and different things related to that. So it, it was it was just a lot, and the company made lots of money doing it. It was just that when I say the compliance percentage was really low, like, I mean, as a company, from the numbers that I saw, if you started the contest, there would be a 15, 1-5% likelihood that you would even stand on the scale at the end of the contest, regardless of how well you did. 1-5%. Mm -hmm. So it was just, like, super, super low. So... Um, when we changed it, my wife and I were sitting around and we're like, okay, we live in an area where there's only one of these gyms in our entire state. So we're really isolated. Uh, if you did something different, nobody would know. And so as my wife and I are sitting around planning our next one of these challenges, we're like, we just had this guy who won. We got a lot of attention because he did so well. He feels great. We're learning about this now. What if we did something like completely different and rogue? So I went on to Diet Doctor at the time, was a resource that I really enjoyed. I signed up for their meal planning services. I made meal plans every single week. We told people that signed up with us like, okay, here's the packet that the company is going to give you. We're going to do something totally rogue. You're following us because we found something different that works really well. And we're going to give you different meal plans. And we're going to offer seminars and classes to explain all this to you so that you understand the science behind it. And, and we had tremendous success where, where we had people that uh, of, of the numbers we had and the people that, that we got to do it before the pandemic shut us down. I put a hundred, I think we signed up like 180 people to be in these, these contests that we were running. We had about two thirds of them would weigh out of the contest. So the compliance percentage was way closer to like 60% of the, of the group people lost, I want to say it was 732 pounds with 720 of those pounds coming from fat validated on a body fat scale. So men, women, 
Some did yoga, mm -hmm. some ran, some did weight, some wanted to lose weight, some didn't want to lose weight, but we could repeatedly get people to burn exclusively fat and save lean mass by eating these low calorie meals. So that was really fun. It was a fun way to take like, well, we have to do this stupid challenge anyway. Let's do it our way, not tell the company we're going totally rogue and giving them unrecommended stuff and telling people to eat butter and ignore the whole grains and they're crushing it. So I see that on the one hand, I was like a challenge. When, when you ask like low carb carnivore challenges that are out there, on the one hand, it's like, yes, if you are motivated, if somebody's doing it um, for the right reasons and they're signed up with people who are also offering the challenge for the right reasons. I don't I don't have any complaints about any of that. What gets really difficult and the whole reason why we don't offer why we don't do challenges like that. Um, there's no programs that you can go onto our website to purchase is because it can it can very easily drift into now we're selling you products and services and all of this other extraneous stuff that like Maybe people don't need, and it's just like kind of a waste of money. So I don't know. I don't want to poo-poo anybody's programs out there. And I know a lot of people who set up and run those um, types of programs and have success with them. As long as people are getting success with that, I just I also don't love the the the, the salesy kind of vibe that a lot of people already get from our industry to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, I don't love that part of things, which is why we don't offer them. So again, I don't want to, what do they say? I don't want to yuck anybody's yum. <laughs> That's your thing. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that phrase recently. I really like it. Um, if, you're, if you're doing it and you like it and you're seeing benefit, awesome. But also like you and I know a lot of the people we worked with over the years, if you're, if you're really wanting to do a carnivore diet, we may need to talk 30 minutes, like twice three times maybe, and you might be so sorted out after just a few sessions that you don't need us anymore and you're going to be fine for the rest of your life. So yeah, whatever mm -hmm. helps people is great, but I, I just, yeah, I would want people to not get sold a bunch of stuff that they don't need, I guess. Yeah. I mean, that's fair. That absolutely fair. And um, the, the programs, the meal plans that you had been giving people, you mentioned were low calorie plans, but they, and they were generally balanced or they were also low carbohydrate plants. How were people able to burn so much fat and have this compliance? Yeah, the meal plans that came from the company were your classic nutritionist designed type meal plan. So again, yeah. it's the portion of grains, it's the vegetables at every meal, it's everything that I, I learned and was taught to get my nutrition certification, which I still have today. Um, you do a lot of behavior coaching with people because they're not going to be able to do it. And so you sit them down every few weeks and say, like, why did you fail your goal? Did you not eat the rainbow? Did you not eat until you were 80 percent full? Did you not write in your emotion journal enough about your food? And like you get into this space of like you can blame somebody endlessly for not being compliant to some of these things because it's it's like nobody can do it it's not practical the meal plans that we found that i eventually used were low carbohydrate there was no um portion controlling there was no recommendation for calories they were just simply like your classic kind of low carbohydrate meal plans and i would just kind of find a variety of different ones and just give people those recipes every week. I'd make a new one and just be like, okay, this one says taco bowl. This has ground beef and some salsa and an avocado and maybe some lettuce. And you just make that. And you can always add some carbohydrates to it. Maybe your kids don't want to eat this way and they want rice with that. Well, you can do that very easily. But if you stick kind of with this, that would help somebody get into that state of fat burning, which then puts them in a state of ketosis, which then gets that awesome result of fat loss where, you know, normally we were used to seeing people lose weight. We're like, yeah, you can lose weight, but you'll lose lean mass. You'll lose water. You'll lose some mm -hmm. fat as well. But all the while, you're also going to be tanking your metabolic rate, meaning you're teaching your body to burn less and less and less and less calories all the time. That's what I was using that metabolic equipment to even measure. So yeah, you'd lose weight, but it would be weight from everywhere and it would plateau. And then you'd set yourself up to create like crazy weight gain on the back end, which you wouldn't be able to avoid where, yeah, when we told people like, look, eat from these meals, eat as much as you like, only eat when you're hungry. Don't stop eating until you're really, really, really satiated. And then 
and then, yeah, try to feed other people in your family this way. It was a lot of like meatsas or, um, you know, roasts or, or things they could do on the barbecue in the summertime. It was just kind of casual kind of stuff. And unfortunately, Diet Doctor has taken a different direction in the last few years. It's no longer a resource that I can recommend to people. But at the time, it was a really great hub for videos, articles. The meal planning tool was very, um, really, really helpful for that. And we saw tremendous results with that. Awesome. I see a lot of people and I help a lot of people who um, tend to undereat, and especially on carnivore because they're so satiated. They say, well, I can't possibly eat more than a pound of meat. Since you are in that metabolic space where you really understand people's metabolisms and what keeps them going and how they can best utilize nutrients to help them burn their body fat, what do you think helps people with a like a depressed metabolism. Can you share with us sort of the realities of what happens when you're under eating? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I love this topic. I could talk about this endlessly. So the we we would so again doing using this equipment expensive equipment if you want to go get this done on your own or whatever you can but it, it costs money um i'll tell you how you can kind of know for free what's going on and how you can make adjustments to it basically like if you had done calorie restriction so keeping your calories quite low usually combined with lots of exercise you've done that for long enough that your body is adapting to it basically what you're doing is sending signals to your body that says we don't have enough we're really hungry can't find enough food, and this human is running around expending a lot of energy looking for food, which it doesn't have. That's the only thing our body can kind of understand as we've evolved. If that were the scenario, your body would think like, okay, wow, like we need to be in conservation mode. Like we're looking for energy and there's not enough. What are you going to do in that state? What's going to be smart? It's like if I told you the economy was going to suck this next year, would this be the year that you would go and buy that Ferrari and spend? Or would this be the year that you might think like, maybe I better tighten up a little bit and save some money back just in case something happens. And our body is the exact same way. So that your body will start to shut down anything that is non-essential. If you had like Think of like really nice thick hair or, you know, your nails are really strong and thick. Like you you don't need that. It's nice to have, but you don't need that. Think about like reproductive function. Like your body is not going to want to reproduce a child in an environment where there's not enough energy. So sexual function goes down. Testosterone or your sex hormones might change. You know, your, your core body temperature, this is a really common one. Your core body temperature might be coming down. Um, so you might feel colder as your body's not able to generate a lot of energy from heat. Um, and these are all just again, classic kind of um, adaptations to a starvation state in humans. This is what we do and this is what happens. And then when you find the food, when you're, you've taught yourself to become more efficient, now it's very easy to be on the other side of that balance. And now you can gain weight rather quickly, especially when you're eating the types of foods that we didn't have when we were evolving that we do now, which is like a combination of really delicious fats and carbohydrates together, like donuts and pizzas and burritos and like all this amazing delicious food that is very, you know, hedonistic and uh, addictive. And so all of that to say, if you are doing a carnivore diet, any kind of diet, and you're not consuming enough energy, you're not eating enough, maybe you're over fasting. Those are some of the things I would really be looking out for. Are you getting fatigued? Um, are your cravings going higher? Do you feel like you're retaining weight around the midsection that may be leaning out in your arms and legs? And the big one especially is, are you feeling cold, especially in your hands and feet? If it's July and you need a jacket, if you feel like other people around you are always running a little bit hot, but you feel cold, again, especially in your hands and feet, that is a great sign that your metabolic rate is declining. So I did this uh, on Carnivore. Um, you know, people say you can eat as much as you like, and it is a, a big thing where like, yeah, you're carnivore, like you can go and do OMAD, which I did, and you can do it for quite a while and be fine. It's convenient. You're only eating one meal a day. That's what OMAD stands for. I did that for too long, like several years, to the point that I started to notice in myself that like, oh, I am feeling cold. I am getting cravings. I need to, I'm not eating enough. This one time a, a day, I'm eating to satiety. That's not enough for me. That's when I started to bring in another meal around lunchtime. And again, I'm in a point now that I don't need to do that all the time. But you can get in a place where under consuming any kind of food is being detrimental and is slowing down your metabolic rate. And I would expect that a period of fat gain would follow up that. So nobody really wants to go down that route. So yeah, all that to say, like, it, it is important to 
be sure that you're eating enough and pay attention for those signs. That's fantastic because oftentimes people will, and I even advise people to sort of rely on a calculator to say, you know, well, what is your BMI? What's your activity level? And, you know, your height and your weight and how many calories you should be eating and sort of stay within these guidelines. But the cues that you're talking about are going to be far more accurate for that particular person than any calculator could be, you know, really check in on yourself. I love that idea, like checking in, check, checking in on your temperature, your hands, your feet, your cycles, and see if you are eating enough. Yeah, I'll give you some examples. This is this is quite interesting. But yes, what you're referring to is called the Harris Benedict formula, and it's based on somebody's age, height, weight, and gender. They can punch that in. Some more advanced calculators, like if you have like body fat percentage versus muscle mass, that can help you determine a little bit tighter. It's a really good starting point, and everybody's is going to be different just based on your size, your gender, that sort of thing. Um, it is an estimate, and so I'll give you like. The one person I trained after she, or I tested after she had gotten kicked off the biggest loser, um, this woman came in, had been doing the biggest loser, got kicked off, decided to measure her metabolic rate. That equation that we added up, beep, boop, beep, came up to be, she should be burning 2000 calories at rest. She was burning about a thousand. So she yeah. already cut her metabolism in half. So if we would have gone by that other calculation for metabolic rate, she would have been way off and she would have gained tons of fat, which she did anyway. Like you can't, you're going to gain weight when you're in that kind of state. The opposite thing would also happen though, when I, when I would test somebody who was starting to do ketogenic diets, and especially when people started to do intermittent fasting, fasting is so different than then um, caloric restriction, it works on a totally different thing. So somebody might come in, I remember a dude, he just started doing time-restricted eating. He should have had a metabolic rate based on that equation of about 1,950. He came in and did the test. His metabolic rate was 2,600. So his was 650 calories higher than what that formula told him. And I said, what I told everybody is like, well, you now that's your minimum. You have to eat at least that as the minimum or you're going to have that lowering effect. And he's like, dude, I can't eat that many calories what am I going to do like go back to soda and Twinkies like that's the only way I'm going to get to that many calories but it was because he was fasting his body was burning all the calories from his stored body fat so he was losing tons of fat without eating, being that hungry and eating that much and that's why we get a ramp up in your metabolic rate versus when somebody does calorie restriction you get the opposite and you ramp down so the, the formula is great and it's a great place to start but there can be so much variance and that, that's a that's a cool way to think about it. Like even if you just buy like a $3 VIX thermometer and just test your body temperature, that can tell you a lot about your metabolism. If you're running cold, you might have a lowered metabolic rate and you may want to start to ramp up the number of calories um, that you're eating. Different schools of thought out there, right? Like there's um, Robert Sykes, Keto Savage, who will, he'll be able to gain weight by just eating more of the same foods that he eats to stay keto. He'll just ramp them up slowly and eat more and more. There's other schools of thought that say like, okay, if you've really crushed your metabolic rate, maybe this is the time to like go have a cheeseburger and a shake and fries and some junk food. And like, yeah, that's not the best for health optimization, but it is a big calorie bomb that can increase your metabolic rate. So different ways of thinking about it, but those are things I'd be, I'd be thinking of when you're thinking like, how is my metabolism working? Wow. I mean, that's fantastic. And so that kind of a thing, that last bit that you were talking about would be sort of a, a caloric refeed, right? So you're eating sort of your base calories, your resting metabolic rate, plus some additional calories for whatever, however much you're working out. And then you just go really in on calories and get a refeed. And you find that that, have you found that? I mean, Robert's talking about that. Are, are you finding that those uh, like refeed days are helpful for people? Yeah, yes. Um, caveats, right? I mean, like, again, I know for me that if I have a big fast food bomb, I will get anxiety and all my cravings will come back for like a day mm. and a half. So it's not like insurmountable, It's but it's not ideal. I don't like it. You know what I mean? Some people can get away with it and they don't have that, you know, addictive side of things and they can do like a cheat day or whatever. Uh, Robert is not one of those those people. So when he does his, he calls it a reverse diet where you're building back up your metabolic rate to restore better health. He does it after like a bodybuilding show where he gets his body fat down to like 3% body fat, which is, and we both agree is not healthy, but it's cool you can do that it's not very healthy um he'll add he'll he'll just eat his same diet which is mostly carnivore but he'll like 
I mean, it's to like 10 grams more of food every single day. Like it's mm -hmm. a tiny minuscule amount and you just ramp that up over a lot of time and be really patient with the process. I've seen it work either way. Uh, I've had another period of time in my life where I was on a mixed diet. I had had something very stressful happen to me. I ended up losing a bunch of weight because of the stress. I did so in a way that, that lowered my metabolic rate. Uh, I could feel it. And so I was eating like tons of fast food. I got up to a really, really heavy weight, but it's, it's ironic because I was eating so many calories, my metabolism went up and I ended up burning off all the extra energy because my metabolism was higher. So again, there's different ways to think about it. Um, you have to think, so many of us think about weight loss and fat loss without considering like, what about your mental health? What about your cravings? What about, you know, seed oils or oxalate? There's all these other things that you need to consider that's outside of just weight loss. So yeah, mm -hmm. different ways to do it. I think you can be successful in a lot of different ways, but I'd, I'd probably stay more on the carnivore side and just like add a meal or uh, try to get a few extra bites of food where you can. Gotcha. Um, I wanted to just ask you because you oftentimes will recommend a ketogenic diet to people. How important is keto like to you? And is there a number that you like people to hit if they're testing ketones? Do you feel like there's a, a, a spot where people should stay all the time? Or do you believe like ketosis is something you should go in and out of? Great question. Um, so so what, I, what I recommend for people is that they, for some period of their life, enjoy the benefit of being in ketosis, whatever that looks like. I have never once, not one time in all my six years of being in the low carb space, I've ever tested my ketones. I have no idea where they are. Um, it's not something I do or really recommend for people. I have a few clients who do because they want to. I just don't, it's not really relevant to me. It's not relevant to most of my clients. I get, although again, some people like to do that. Um, I think I would tell people that like, I would want you to have a really specific and strong reason to be testing ketones um, before you start doing it. Like if it's just gee whiz, I don't think that's really going to help you. But if you get a cancer diagnosis or you've got epilepsy or you're, you know, had a, di a dementia diagnosis or something, you're trying to treat that, like that might be more important to kind of track. Um, Finding the number for ketones is there's a lot of information out there. And some people say it always needs to be high. Some people say 0.3 or higher is just fine. Again, I think there's different levels to that. And I think there's different reasons to do certain diets for lots of different reasons. So for most people, I don't think they need to do that. If you have a specific and, and again, a strong reason, then you can maybe track. Um, it might just be helpful to like see where you are when you feel really good and try to match that up day to day. But the thing that I'm promoting for most people is like to be in ketosis is just simply your body's natural and normal state of fat burning that we have evolved largely in. Um, I'll maybe point out to people that like at the time of this recording, it's almost summertime. It's beautiful outside. Tons of stuff is growing. There's a huge variety of plants and shrubs and, you know, all kinds of stuff growing. And like none of it is edible. Like you couldn't just go outside and like live. You would have to obligatorily, at least this time of year and through the winter time, you would have to live on stored fat and be you would you would naturally be in a state of ketosis and so i think there's a lot of benefit to that and i think more people than not should try to do whatever it takes to be in ketosis whether that's quote unquote the keto diet which i don't super recommend unless somebody wants to uh whether that's doing some time restricted eating whether that's doing full carnivore um whatever it is for you i just think it's really beneficial in so many different ways for us to be in a state of ketosis um whether people do long term or whether they flex in and out i i don't think is super important i think it's just a deciding like you know how how do you feel when you're on how do you feel when you're off is it worth it to go off do you get cravings and all those crappy things again, or, or are you a moderator and you can get off and be just fine. It's totally fine. So just like to have people kind of be as pragmatic as they can about that and do what they think is best. Well, and that sort of goes back to that sort of mellow approach to carnivore, where if you can sort of cycle in and out of having some seasonal fruits, if, if you're okay with them, okay. Like if you can moderate, okay. If, you know, if you eat an avocado, like it's okay, you know, um, nobody's going to take away your carnivore card. And that kind of approach makes it so much more sustainable than for people to try to be so completely strict um, or to live by a ketone meter, you know, a, a, and to try and like maintain these boundaries that are sort of arbitrary, you know, um, 
you know, getting back to challenges where you're doing one food for a certain period of time or four foods for a certain period of time. And that may work for people in a, sh a short term and it may motivate people and it may give them some results, but long term, can you sustain that? And like, you know, trying to find the, uh, an appropriate diet that you can sustain for a very long time is not going to be like a one ingredient thing. So, you know, it's sometimes motivating for people to have these like quote unquote resets. Um, but you know, long term, it's like you said, it's, it's, it's finding that I think, I think for everybody, it's sort of a meat based diet where you're in ketosis some of the time and not therapeutic ketosis, but a mild state, which is just natural and keeping things kind of on the low carb side, which is sort of how we evolved and how I think, you know, I agree we should sort of be living. We, we talked about under eating on carnivore quite a bit, but I'm curious as to your thoughts about overeating on carnivore and is that possible? And do calories matter if you're eating strictly like beef, butter, bacon, and eggs, or just, just meats? What have you seen in this? You had to ask this question. That has I had so to, I've got to know nuanced. what oh, you think. Geez. So, so as an example, Again, we can use Robert Sykes as an example, assuming he's telling me the truth, which I think he is, that he got himself down to like 155 pounds at 3% body fat. You know, I saw him at the conference I was at. He's at 185, 190, and he's at 15 to 18% body fat, something like that. And he gained weight and gained fat, like literally by eating the same foods and just eating more of them. So his point was like, can you gain weight and can you eat gain fat by eating protein and fat? I did. I clearly just did. I showed everybody that I did. So you can. And I don't disagree with that. I wonder if it's more something like, um, you know, I can kind of maintain myself somewhere around like 18 to 20 percent body fat and not track and eat seemingly whatever I want and eat to full satiety. And I just, I don't tend to like fluctuate my body fat percentage that much. And so I wonder in Robert's case, was he able to gain weight and fat because he wasn't eating an, an optimal human diet and the amount that he had to, to compete at that level. And that was just his body getting back up to where his homeostasis was. I, I think, I do think calories matter. I just don't think they matter in the way that a lot of people think about them. Uh, in, yeah, like you get to that thing of like, if you're trying to lose your own body fat, um, and you want that to go down, do you need to be taking in endless amounts of fat in your diet? Should you be having tons of butter with your steak or is that not going to be great for you? Uh, it was just so interesting to host you on the show and talk about lipidema and how your high protein approach has worked so well for you. And then a few weeks later, talking to Siobhan Higgins, or I'm sorry, Siob Siobhan Huggins, who does a high fat version and that helps her with her lipedema. So there, there's so many different approaches. Um, I think at the end of the day, you just have to try yourself and see what works. Um, again, I'm not willing to say at this point that calories don't matter. I think they're part of the equation, but there's also like, what are the calories then making your body do that then changes the equation. What if you're eating calories that, yeah, it's too much now, but then they're lifting your metabolic rate. So now tomorrow you're, you're now eating the same because of what you ate yesterday and the week before, you know what I mean? So there's, mm -hmm. there's so much to it. Um, and I think, I think I, if I, if given the choice, I would lean more towards the intuitive side with whatever boundaries you need to eat intuitively in a smart way, right? Like not eating intuitively, I would eat pie, but I can be carnivore and say, I eat a carnivore diet. Now I'm going to eat intuitively. And I'm choosing between ribeye and New York versus choosing a pie or a cake and a soda. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, and it is true. There are absolutely different approaches that work for different people. And it's fascinating. And even in myself, I know that what worked for me years ago no longer serves me now, but that's not to say that what's serving me now is not going to change in the future again. And I, I feel like when people get locked into one particular paradigm and they start, you know, shouting it from the rooftops, it, it may be their truth at that time. And then maybe that might change. And I love when you see somebody sort of like evolve and and grow and like, you know, increase their knowledge set to say, yeah, sometimes different approaches work for different people. And this is not to say that anybody is lying or that their experience, you know, that they're sharing is 
false or untrue. It's um, it's just different for different people. So yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, um, since you are coaching a lot of people, um, changing topics just a little bit, what do you find um, is most motivating to keep people on track with whatever their eating plan, their training plan is? Some people say you have to like find your why. Some people say you have to find your why not. Is there something that you tell people that helps them stay motivated? Because sometimes, you know, willpower to stay on the program just because, you know, Casey's a nice guy and he really wants me to do this isn't really enough. Is there something that you can share with the audience to help them sort of stay on track? It's such a vexing question. You ask great questions. I was just listening to you and um, Bronson on the episode you guys did together kind of chat this out. And I think yeah. as coaches, we think about this endlessly. You think about this all the time. What's what's the difference between this one guy I do two calls with and he's like thriving and fine and doesn't need me anymore and he's crushing it. And this other person who knows all this stuff. We've been talking about the same thing for five and a half years and, and he's got good reason to do it, maybe a chronic disease and he just, like donuts are that good. He just can't round the corner. And so if I, if I think if I had the right answer for you, I would probably not tell you and I'd sell it in a pill or a potion or something and I would make millions of dollars and ride <laughs> off into the sunset. It's, it's, it's really, it's really tough. It's a tough question to answer. I think that's fair. As I was as I was thinking about that, I, I was actually hoping you would ask this because again, I was just listening to you and Bronson kind of chat this out, and it's always interesting to think about. The thing that I go back to is like my one of my favorite sayings is when pain increases, hearing improves. So like any kind of change you make, especially in a positive direction, it's going to suck. It's not going to be very fun. Like I, I think you and I would admit, like being a carnivore. It's like, we got it down, but it's kind of like not that easy. And it's not that fun when, you know, you see other people around you and they're eating spaghetti and you love spaghetti, but you can't eat spaghetti because, you know, you found carnivore to help you in a different way. It's weird socially. It's, you know, you kind of have to commit to something and you have to pass on really delicious foods. And so of, of all the people I coach, it's kind of funny to me when I really look at them and say like, you know what, it's actually not many people are actually doing a carnivore diet um, unless they specifically want to and they've got a very strong reason to do it because it comes with a lot of sacrifice. So I think, I think you really should try to feel what it feels like to have optimal health, feel what it feels like to be in ketosis, be on a carnivore diet. I think everybody should try. And then you can kind of over time, loosen things up and see what things, you know, give you the freedom that you want, but also the benefit that you want. And you can decide, is it worth it or not? At the end of the day, I do want people to be motivated. I want my people to succeed. That said, I'm not in the kitchen with them. I'm not making their decisions. They have to do that themselves. And they're probably doing it based on how challenging it is for them or against kind of what benefit they're getting from it. So, Again, it's a tough question to answer. Um, again, I, I do try to get my people motivated, but at the end of the day, they've got to be motivated for themselves. And if they don't have a strong enough reason why they're doing it, they might not be motivated enough to stay on the diet. Right. I mean, Is that I, a yeah, cop-out I, answer? Like, what do you think? Not at all. <laughs> No, not at all. I mean, it, that's the thing is that it is very hard, especially in our food environment to say no. I speak to people all the time that say things to me like, I was doing so well, but I work in this office and then you know, they always are coming around with donuts. And it's very hard socially to not take the donut, you know? And if you're coming from like, especially if you're coming from a food addiction background, it is extremely hard to not take the donut. And it's not just donuts. It's not just, you know, obviously donuts are unhealthy, but it's the other things like just social lunches out where they're maybe they're passing around wine, or like you said, there's a basket of, you know, bread on the table. And it, it's like, it's like those just social meals that everyone else is having. And you're making these sacrifices because you know, bread is delicious and you want to eat it. And it's like, is it that, is it going to kill you? No, it's not going to kill you. And so then people don't really have that motivation because they're like, I'll be fine. You know, I'll be fine. It'll be okay. And then after a few months go by, they realize they've, you know, slipped back into really bad habits and they're feeling really terrible again. And then they find the motivation again. And I think sometimes that's why people sort of have this need for like a carnivore reset, you know, because where they go back and forth because they fall into things and they realize I felt my best doing carnivore. 
but it is honestly, it is hard to stay motivated. And I think there's, there's a lot of people who have found the simplicity in it to be motivating enough, you know, like the ease of it, maybe that it is, it's honestly very budget friendly if you're doing it a certain way. Um, and that makes doing a carnivore diet easier. And, you know, what just, if you're feeling better, it just makes it more motivating, but a lot of people um, are able to, you know, not be strict carnivore. And then it, it leads them into places, like I said. Um, Casey, thank you so much for your time. It's I so appreciate enjoy. talking to you and I have loved having you on. And um, I do wanna do this again with you. I think our chats are just the best. You've given so much information to people. I'm, I'm super intrigued with this idea of testing body temperature to check for metabolic rate. I think that that's like such a great tip. And like you said, a low cost tip um, and checking in on your own like physiological signals to see if you're eating enough. And I love how you sort of detailed getting your metabolism up and that that is so helpful for people who are chronically under eating. So thank you so much. It's always so much fun. Oh, so much fun to chat with you. This has been great. I love chatting with you. And you asked really, really great and very thoughtful questions, which I really appreciate. So thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Can you share with people where they can find you and talk about where your podcast is and how they can get in touch with you? Yeah. So the easiest place is just our website, which is myboundlessbody.com. You can go there. The first thing people will see is a book now button where you could book a free 30 minute uh, session with us. We don't get tons, but I wish more people would take us up on that. And I say it on my podcast all the time, like even if it's just to like introduce yourself, say hi, bounce some ideas off each other. Like we love meeting and connecting with people all over the place, regardless of whether we're doing, you know, sessions with people or not. We just love chatting and love offering whatever we can do, whatever we can offer to help. That's the kind of hub of where they can find everything. Our website, on the website, you can also find our podcast, which is Boundless Body Radio. That's on all the major podcast players. We do releases there every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and sometimes on a, fr a Saturday or Sunday. So there's a lot of really good information there. It can be a little bit overwhelming because we've got like 650 episodes now. Um, so if you if you have a question about a particular topic, just message me. Go to our website and message me and just say, hey, look, I'm really interested in this. And I can give you you know a few of the episodes that I would recommend, including the great ones that I did with you. And then just one other thing that I'm doing for free this year. Um, that, when I was at this, this gym, um, I started doing this in the summer time when my business would slow down. I just started teaching nutrition seminars out by the pool deck in the summer. And I would just meet every week and, and everybody would like have a curriculum that I would make up and we'd go through an outline and talk about different things and um, had a lot of fun doing that. And that stopped during the pandemic, but I'm bringing that back in my neighborhood this year. And so we've been doing, um, we've been doing that every day. And so if you're in the Salt Lake area and you want to stop by, we'd love to see you. Information on that is on our website, but also all the material that we're doing live, we're also putting on YouTube and that's all can be found on our website for free. So a few of those really great meal plans that really help people, those are all there. The videos of what we do, those are all there. Um, the lesson outlines, references, all that kind of stuff. Today we talked about the big fat surprise. So we started telling the story of why we think saturated fat is bad for us and Ansel Keys and the American Heart Association and Crisco and all that stuff. And it's really funny to see people who are listening and they're like, wait, what? Like their mind starts to get a little bit blown from Yeah, it's like a big brain moment. Like, wait a minute, yeah. I have been lied to this whole whole time <laughs> crazy i really always hope somebody gets like really angry uh when they find out but um anyway all of that is just on the website so that's the easiest place so my boundlessbody.com awesome thank you that's amazing you that you have all those free resources there thank you so much i will link to all of those casey enjoy the rest of the day and i hope to speak to you again soon let's uh, do this again yes. okay hope we can do this again soon thank you so much Linda. okay great thanks casey bye yeah